Welcome to the Growth Lab Podcast, where we talk about finding new clients, winning more contracts, and growing successful cleaning businesses. I'm your host, Matt Harris, and I run the Growth Lab. We partner with cleaning business owners to launch, accelerate, and scale the growth of their business with tried and tested systems and strategies that generate predictable revenue. If you're turning over at least six figures and you want to grow your cleaning business to seven figures plus, click on the link in the description and schedule a call. Now let's dive in. Welcome back to the Growth Lab podcast. I'm really excited about this episode. I am with James Church, an Amazon best-selling author of The Investable Entrepreneur, COO of Robot Mascot, a global award-winning investment readiness agency, an all-round knowledgeable guy. So James, look, rather than me running down your list of achievements, why don't you give the audience a little introduction? Well, thanks for having me. Thrilled to thrilled to be here. Like you say, I've, I've written a book. It did all right. It's I became a bestseller. I'm sure it's done more um, than all right. It's, it's but... That, that book basically articulates our process for getting getting founders ready for investment, helping them raise raise the investment they're looking for to kind of grow or scale their business. Our clients are 40 times more likely to raise investment as a result of that approach. They've raised more than 220 million to date. One, one global award for for that approach and and the work we do with the business robot mascot. So um, yeah. it's good. So just before we went on, we, we had a little chat about your backstory, interesting journey to where you got to now. So as our audience is primarily small business owners, generally in the sort of cleaning and facilities management space. What I'm quite interested to learn, and maybe a bit from a selfish perspective, is if I had a, a, a cleaning business right now and I was looking to to grow the business, I've got a couple of options, obviously organic growth, which takes a little bit of time, or to go through a sort of buy and build strategy. With that, obviously, you would need some cash to help sort of fund that that approach. Talk to me a little bit about if I came to you with this sort of idea, what are the sort of steps that I need to go through to, to get myself investment ready? So there's kind of three key components, really. Um, the first is to make sure you have a really solid business case. You, you really demonstrate to an investor, you understand how to create commercial success, what that strategy looks like. So you mentioned a buy and build strategy, but... Yeah. What, what's the detail around that in the, in the short term? What are you going to be doing in the next 12 to 18 months with any capital you bring on board? What does that look like in the longer term to, to continue to scale that business so that you can deliver the investor the type of returns they're looking for? Because yeah. you know, often they're looking for a 10, 30x return on their investment or, or more in, in a sort of a five to 10 year period. So what's the time scales? What's the strategy in the short and the long term articulating that and, and why why this needs to exist, what the what's mm-hmm. exciting about it, what makes you different, what's your unique selling point, how do you differentiate differentiate yourself in the market, what opportunities are there to be a, to to take advantage of, but also looking at the risks, right? Yeah. Not being oblivious to those risks and kind of saying to an investor, look, there are risks involved. These are the risks that we need to be aware of in the market. But here's how we're going to mitigate them, and here's plans. That, so so you're showing you've got you've got sight on potential risks but you have to deal with them if they come your way so if you can kind of build that that strategy first and foremost you've got this solid business case that this buy and build strategy is going to work and for the first step the first acquisition for example i need x funding to, to make that happen i've got some targets that i want to want to acquire maybe i've already already in conversations with one of them and, and i just need the funding to to make it happen that the the, the, ter- the agreements there in principle who, who knows but you've got that business case and investors are confident that you can deliver them a return the next thing you need to create is the financial forecast how does that business case mm. translate financially yeah. what does this look like can you deliver me the type of returns i'm looking for are you are you a fade do you have the the, the financial literacy to really understand what this looks like in the longer term, not just the short term play, but how do you turn this into a return on investment, profitability, millions in revenues in the longer term? Um, and do you understand all the costs involved in that? Because mm. a lot of founders can be quite naive as to how much human resource might be involved at a large scale. And they underestimate the number of staff they need or the amount of marketing they might need to do. And you want to be able to show an investor that, that you really understand what a business like yours operates at looks like at when operating at scale 
where the efficiencies are, but also where the where the costs are going to be. You're going to need an HR team, for example, when you when you scale up, and and a lot of founders forget to think about those sorts of things. And then and then you want to the final thing is to once you've shown you've got a solid business case that you've got financial literacy you understand the financial risks and rewards in this in this strategy what the potential returns are you need to be able to sell it to them with a pitch (laughs) be able to sell that to them in a way that makes them want to engage in this so then you create the the pitch materials clear concise articulate engaging story that that gets investors firstly excited by the vision the the opportunity uh, you as a founder but also reassures them that you've got that business case. You understand the financial numbers behind the business. So interestingly, I've talked about these in the way, the order in which you'd probably develop them. You'd start with the business case. That would then inform the financial model. And then both those two things would inform your pitch. When presenting to an investor, it's the other way around. You start with the pitch. They get excited by (laughs) the vision, the opportunity, trust you have credibility as a founder then they sit down and go through your financial model then they'll sit down and go through and understand the whole business case and then if they're happy with everything they might offer you some money in return for for some equity so that's kind of what you need to do you're going down that route so the pitch kind of opens the door to to the deeper dive right going in and and getting into the granular details and and so i often I often kind of use the analogy of like it's the key that opens the safe, but it's not yeah. the tool that allows you to gain access to the capital. You've kind of got to imagine that it's about a 1% success rate on average for founders securing investment. So it's almost like, imagine you've got kind of a hundred other businesses lined up next to you and there's yeah. a key on a hook, like a hundred meters away. And that key opens the safe. Every time you send your pitch out to a potential investor, it's like you're you're li- lining there on the starting blocks against a hundred of your peers, and it's only the business in the best shape that's going to reach the end of that corridor first, get get yeah. that key, and open the door. And then, even then, you've only just started. You've only just opened the door. You then need the business plan and the projections to to walk through that door and get access to the capital and have them actually sign the deal. So, it's it's definitely the key that opens the door, but it's not the only thing you need as a founder there's there's much more to raising investment than that than that pitch i i so my personal experience what's dragon's den i'm sure you hear often what is is the experience like it is on on dragon's den i think again sort of going on that program the way i look at it and how you've described it is yes they probably had a a a pitch deck ready to to be able to go on the program and their opportunity was assessed for whether or not it's viable for an investment but really just going up there and and doing the pitch is like you say that that just opens the door to them wanting to find out more about you your understanding of the opportunity that you presented as you explained, the the business use case and the the financials. Like, what what are some of the specifics? I guess that that would need to be covered in the business case, for example. Because I yeah. know there's a lot of research involved in that. But give me some specifics. Like, what what yeah. are some common details that that need to be included? Okay, I'll just pick up on the dragon's den point for a second as sure. well. It's a it's a good one. Like. Because everyone's there with their presentation. They've already been through the production team to get on the show. But then you see the ones that actually make it to TV. And obviously, maybe one an episode gets a yes from the investors and the rest are all no's. But you get that initial pitch. Then there's all the questions afterwards. And that's where you need to really understand your numbers and your projections and your business strategy. And then I think it's about 90% of deals or or something, 50, 80, 90% of deals that that you see have it get a yes on TV. Yeah. end up falling through in due diligence so after the show the 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 team behind those dragons start going through the business case the financials making sure it all checks out with what was said mm. on the in the pitch and most of the time those deals never actually make it through and they all just oh, wow. fall through free in due diligence so that's what that's the bit you don't see which yeah. is why a lot of people think oh, i just need that pitch i get in that room the investor says i'll invest and then there's like a stack of cash on the table job done <laughs> just doesn't that's made for tv it doesn't work like that there's there's three four five six meetings of going through all the detail before they'll then say they'll invest and then there's a a fairly long-winded legal process that you have to go through to Mm. to close the deal so it's, it's important that anyone thinking of going down this route 
doesn't think that this is kind of put together a pitch, turn up, there's going to be five or six people sitting there, you're going to pitch, and then there's going to be a wad of cash on the table and you're going to kind of walk <laughs> away and the deal's done. It, it just doesn't doesn't work like that. But so so the sorts of things that you would need to include in that business case that that you would have coming up in that due diligence process that we don't see on TV, that, that sort of happens in the background. I think in my experience, it is a really solid short-term plan. So how are you going to spend the money now to get to your next kind of strategic milestone? So that could be the next point at which you're going to need to raise more investment for more growth. So what am yeah. I doing between now and, and that next point in time where I need to raise more money? Or it could be between now and reaching profitability. Maybe okay. I need one round of funding and then the business turns profitable. It could be the acquisition of, of this this other business. But what, what do the next 12 to 18 months look like typically? Step by yeah. step, month by month, these are the activities we're going to do across business operations, product development, sales and marketing, recruitment, all of those key areas of the of the business. Then looking at things from a longer term perspective and going, what's the longer term plan here? Once we've achieved those goals, what happens over the next five to 10 years? Do we move into new markets? Do we launch new services? Do we make some further strategic acquisitions? What, what does that look like? How are we going to add value to this company, this asset? Because ultimately, yeah. that's how the investors are going to get their return. They're not doing this. They're rarely doing this for the dividends. They would much rather those dividends are reinvested. That profit is reinvested back in the okay. business for growth. Because when you sell a business, you tend to sell it for a multiple of profit. Yeah. Maybe a maybe a 2x, 3x, 4x, 5x, 20x for a tech company yeah. of, of profit. So if I, I could take profit now as a dividend, say 100k, in dividends but if i reinvested that into the business for growth so that business can then achieve a 10x return on investment that 100k i could have taken out as a dividend is worth 1 million to me when i sell the business so most investors would rather the profits kept in the business and reinvested if it's a sort of a short term sort of medium term 5 to 10 year play rather than a 30 plus year play and then you might be looking at dividends but it's normally a keep the money in the business keep it growing because i'd much rather sell the business and and then get the return so we look want to look at the long-term plan for adding value to the business making it more valuable and therefore getting a larger multiple at exit yeah and we not want to also kind of allude to the exit strategy. Who are we building this for? How does the investor get their money back? What are our plans to making sure we deliver that moment for investors and yourself? Because it's your own blood, sweat and tears going into this as well. So how do we yeah. get the return? Who we, We're building this company for two entities. One is our customers. And we need to obviously keep them happy because they're vital to our growth. We also need to build something that someone wants to acquire at some point. Now, they might not care about our service or our product. They might care about our customer database. They might care about our internal systems and processes. WhatsApp famously exited having not made any revenue yeah. because their technology and their customer database was valuable enough for Facebook and Microsoft to end up in a bidding war. And what was it, 20, 20 million or billion or something? It was sold yeah, for? it was a crazy number. No, zero revenue. It was a free app that they the founders didn't know how to make money out of but the 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 ip the technology and the customer database the users on that platform yeah. were worth 20 billion so they weren't buying it for revenue and most people think i need a highly re that's the thing that people might be buying when they buy my business is the amount of revenue it's got not always there's other things that are valuable to an acquirer so you need to think about who who would buy this business and why and am i building the right assets in my business to command a, a high valuation so you can think about those sorts of things in your business plan as well so they're the kind of three elements really short-term plan long-term growth and what's your what's your exit plan and if you can okay. cover those three things you've got a pretty robust kind of future mapped out for what you want to achieve with the investor's money so that they get what they want from this yeah so remember, that's what this is about they're buying yeah your shares and they're doing it because they want them to be worth more in the future and to get a return on their investment. So yeah. kind of telling them the story of this is different to an operational business plan, which is something you share with your team to say, this is what we're doing right now. This is a story to investors that says, 
here's how we're going to turn your 100k investment into me today into 1 million 2 million 3 million mm-hmm. in the future and you want them to go whoa i trust you <laughs> yeah, with my yeah. cash. like take it turn it into 3 million thank you very and much nice and so uh, obviously the i guess the the financials contribute to just supporting the short and long term journey right to kind of make sure that they're sensible enough and they're realistic in terms of cost expenditure sort of forecasting so with that in mind where where do you see most businesses fall down in in respect to those three elements so so the the forecasts the projections map out what the financial result of that strategy looks like so if your plan is to launch into new markets or expand into a new territory or to to do a strategic acquisition you're mapping out what that looks like financially and making sure the business can afford to do so and if it can't how it finances it whether through um, equity investment or debt finance or or whatever it may be so it's just making sure that that your plans are you you've got a solid financial plan to make those things happen and how you're going to finance it over the long term and how many rounds of investment you might need or how much debt finance you might need in the future and then understanding that you will need that to make this plan happen Um, and the other thing is to show a kind of it's really difficult for a founder it's it's like finding a balancing act between showing the ambition and going yeah we we've got ambitions to create a highly valuable highly exitable business sort of business that's going to have people queuing up to want to buy it look at all the revenue this business has the potential to generate while also showing some kind of reality as to how long that will take or how Mm. quickly it can it can happen and how much cash is involved in making sure that that happens at speed and at pace and then getting that balance right which is why we often see like a bit of a hockey stick as they call it in in those charts because it often takes a long time it normally takes as long to go from zero to one million as it does from one million to ten million all right so so often a lot of founders might sort of predict growth too soon and and actually sometimes those early years can be the toughest because you haven't got any resource right yeah, you find yeah. everything yourself you've got no capital <laughs> yeah. you've got no resource but as soon once you sort of get to that sort of million mark you tend to have a bit more resource available so you can start yeah. bringing in more team you can start bringing in more 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 consultants and services and agencies and, and then you can grow quicker because you've got more capacity and more resource and that's where the funding comes in really is if you okay. want to accelerate that if you're bootstrapping your business it takes as long to get to a million as it does one million to ten funding comes in to say well we want to shorten that cycle we need resource we can't afford it now because we're not profitable we're not generating revenue as a business or much revenue as a business so i need to bring in some financing to accelerate that journey and get to that point quicker so that we can deliver the return sooner and it's just getting that balancing act in the forecast really and just showing that you you understand things don't happen overnight you've got a realistic expectation of how quickly you can get to a million post funding and then how quickly you can go from one to ten million as a result of future funding and and that you've just got everything sort of in a reasonable yet ambitious (laughs) <laughs> scenario and it's it's yeah, like see how that is. Is. you're on a night because <laughs> you'll speak to one investor and they'll go there's no way you're going to grow that quickly tell me how you're going to make that happen i don't believe yeah. that at all and then you'll go to another investor and they'll go you're not going growing quick enough i want to see this growth and you'll go i don't know where and they all have their it's just opinions at the end of the day and you've just got to have that confidence so no this is my plan this is what we're doing i'm looking for an investor that buys into what I can achieve in the way I want to do it. And if they don't believe that I can achieve it in these times, then perhaps they're not the right fit for me because other people are saying, I'm going, I could go quicker than this. And you can go, great, we'll invest in us then and and help us go quicker. So it's just about making sure that you tread that fine line, but you're not saying I'm going to be a billion dollar business by Christmas. You know, um, unicorns by Christmas is a little bit of a pipe dream. And So you've mentioned, obviously, founders quite a bit. Is it normally the case that um, when startups or or more mature businesses come to you to to get pitches ready, do they normally have an an established team? 
And if so, like who are the sort of key contributors who impact the presenting the the business case and also uh, presenting the the financials? Like what what sort of role yeah. do they have within the business? So investors invest in teams, yeah. but the definition of team is quite a loose one, depending okay. on your stage of development. So if you're early stage business, sort of at the concept stage, maybe you're pre-revenue, maybe you're even pre-launch, the chances are it's, it's like a single founder or maybe a co-founder. Okay. So that team therefore becomes the, the founder with a, some advisors around them. You want <laughs> some good strategic advisors and you're, you're leveraging those advisors and we're going to be successful because I can leverage the, the insights and experience of these individuals as well as my own personal experience. And I also recognize that I have weaknesses in these areas. I can't be good at everything myself. So mm. <clears throat> my first strategic hire is this individual who I've already identified and is ready to quit their job as soon as we get the funding. And I'm building a team around me and I can pitch this vision and I have people wanting to quit their top level corporate job, come mm. and work for me for kind of what I can afford to pay them, which is like a very base salary with a bit of equity thrown in because they believe in what I'm doing and they want to be part of the journey. If you can pitch that at an early stage, that that's kind of the ideal, right? So you're showing you can build a team and you will be building a team. And you've got a team ready to go. Yeah. We just need the capital to unlock it. And we've already got advisors that are, that are staking their reputation, giving me their time to, to get this off the ground. Then after that, you're starting to then build a team. So you might have a CFO, a CEO, or someone in those marketing person, and you might start to then show a, a more formalized internal team yeah. and then, and then grow from, grow from there. So it's about showing you just it's more it's it's less about thinking about showing a team because i think that gets people thinking they need to have a co-founder or they need to have employees and more about showing that you're not alone sure that you're not okay. building this in isolation you've got <coughs> resource to leverage so especially i guess at the early stage is leveraging other people's experience right and yeah having having the foresight to identify as part of going through the process i guess for preparing for funding having the foresight to go okay i, I know that this hurdle is coming up this is this is how i propose it can be dealt with and this is the support that i will put in place once we have the necessary funds to kind of manage and, and take care yeah. of this element of, of the business that's it and and if you can get some advisors around you who maybe you've got someone who's an expert in your niche in your sector and really understands the product really well maybe yeah. you've got someone else who's a successful entrepreneur and has built and sold businesses in the past it could be a different space but but they they come with experience and, and insight maybe you've got someone in sales and marketing who who's got a proven track record of growing businesses like yours from sort mm -hmm. of where you are right now to to a larger size that that that's the sort of thing that the investors are looking for this range of expertise in your business that you can leverage the mistake a lot of a lot of early stage founders or business owners make when when sort of trying to build this advisory board is they go oh i've got an old mate at school who's <laughs> like top dog at kpmg i'll ask them to be an advisor and They'll say, of course, mate, no worries. I'll take a bit of equity for a few hours a week and, or, or a few hours a month to, to advise you. And, and you look at it and you go, well, how rel like they're great with multi-million dollar budgets. Hmm. Give them a multi-million dollar marketing campaign and they're fantastic. Easy. But have they ever turned, have they ever hustled a startup from zero customers to 100? No, they have no idea how to do that. They'll be sitting there going, so what you need to do is you need to do this. You go, but that's going to cost me 100 grand. We'll yeah. just go and get a hundred grand from some investors. <laughs> they have no idea at that level. Sure. Um, they're, they're used to doing it at kind of with, with very different budgets. So just because they've got a good CV that has all these corporate names on, like they launched, you know, we've got someone, one of our kind of partners, he's built an agency and his kind of thing is he launched Netflix in Europe. Okay. Brilliant. That doesn't, that's great. But he had the might of the Netflix brand and all the money yeah. <laughs> that they had to do. <laughs> yeah. So being necessarily being a, a startup advisor to someone who's trying to get their first 
few customers for a new platform might not be the right fit. So you just got to you've, you've just got to make sure you get the right sorts of people around you. I think. So look, I understand the the sort of the preparatory work. So my business hypothetically is is along the road now. We've got some traction, and we're we've reached that one million mark. We're ready to go out. I've I've started to build a team, and we're ready to go out and raise some funding. I come to you and say, "Hey, James." Like, here's my business. What do I do now? Talk me through the sort of the next steps. So obviously the, the the first thing is to make sure you have everything we talked about prepared, your business plan, yeah. your financials, your pitch materials, and, and then you, you need to start building relationships with investors, right? You're not going to get anywhere if you don't. It'd be the equivalent of building a website and then not doing any marketing. <laughs> Why is no one buying my product? And it's like, well, you're getting zero views to your, to your <laughs> yeah. website every day like that's why so you and, and you laugh but it's 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 kind of a people go oh that wouldn't be me and the number of founders that kind of do all this work and then they just get scared to if i build it they will there. come right that's yeah what if the... i build it they'll come then but then they have to think about oh i'm going to go pitch to an investor and they get all of these kind of visions of dragon's den and people kind of tearing their business apart and 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 that stops them getting going out there because they're worried bit like people who who are rubbish at asking someone out on a date because they're 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 scared of the rejection it's like well you never ask you're never going to get so so it's that same principle psychologically going through that barrier to actually then put yourself out there put yourself under the spotlight being open to that scrutiny is quite a big personal hurdle to overcome no one can solve that for you. You have to be ready to, to, the more you've prepared, the more confident you'll feel. We yeah. find with our clients in, in putting yourself out there, but you're going to get lots of no's. You're going to get lots of people doubt you and you have to be resilient. You have to kind of focus on what is right and find the investors that do believe in what you, what you're doing. So you need to kind of do large scale outreach, build relationships with investors. And, and the best way to do that is, to build relationships first and ask for money second. So there's a, there's a really good saying that's sort of thrown around the industry, which is ask for money, get advice, ask for advice and get money. Okay. So the best way is to identify some high net worth individuals in your space who understand your sector, some, some successful individuals, angel investors with a track record in your space and just start strike up a conversation, maybe to an angel investor, say, look, I know you've got a previous a track record of investing in our space. I'm not asking for money. Don't worry. I'll probably be launching a funding round in the next three to six months, but I just wanted like the first time I've ever done this. I, I just wondered if you could spare sort of 15, 20 minutes, or maybe I could fire you over a few questions. Cause I'm just trying to figure out how this actually works. Yeah. And you might know the answers, but you're just using this as a, as mm. a way to get through the door and you're just, or can I bend your ear for 15 minutes or can I take you out for lunch? I'd love to pick pick yeah, your, yeah. your brains start to build those relationships first and then that often those advisors or those advisory discussions end up being your first investors but mm. also they can open doors to potential investors as well so it's just about leveraging that network building that network first and finding ways to get in front of people without without kind of selling them the idea of investing in your business because that's the equivalent of a cold call right you're just going hey yeah. I'm James. I'm building a business. Do you want to invest a hundred grand into me? And you're like, who the hell are you? Like, <laughs> so you, Sorry, want to, James, what? you want to build that, that relationship first. So just, just bear that in mind. And you can start that now. Like I say, you don't have to have all this stuff prepared. You could start now and thinking, look, in 12 months time, I might be in a position where I'm looking to do this buy and build strategy. You mentioned start putting the feelers out now, start talking to, to people who've done it in the past and go, you've been successful with this buy and build strategy. What well, could I bend your ear for five, 10, 15 minutes? Get to know that individual. They probably had to get investment at some point in their journey, and they might be able to introduce you to some investors. So it's just about kind of starting building that network with that in mind sooner rather than later. Yeah. Now, if you do use it late, if you do leave it later, if anyone's listening and going, I'm right now kind of, I'm yeah, ready yeah. to go, I've got no investors, that the only way is large scale outreach build a big list of potential investors and contact them in a personalized way that says look i've just launched my funding round i know that you've previously invested in company x y and z we're doing something really exciting in this space 
in a similar space. I'd love to find a time to quickly to, to spend 15, 20 minutes with you explaining what it is we're building because I think you'll be really interested. And you've got no other choice than to do that, but you're going to get lots of no's because they don't know who you are and you need to do it at a high, high scale, hundreds if not thousands of, of emails out to, to prospective investors. And how, so um, just going back to if you ask for advice, you get money. So about five years ago, I, I took that approach. I started a, a little property management business and I, I was looking for funding. I prepared a pitch deck and I literally, I presented it to two people just saying, look, I prepared this. Can you just have a look through and give me your feedback? Like, am I hitting the right notes? I know you've been through this process before. Let me know what you think. And and I actually managed to like soft close one of the two people just by going yeah. through that process. So I didn't go with the intention of no. asking for money. I just wanted feedback. I wanted yeah. to know whether I was on the right track, what changes I needed to make, how I could improve things, what yeah. was the next step in the process. So it is, it's a, a valuable approach to take. And yeah. you're right. I think if you're planning ahead and you kind of know I will need to have funding in 6, 12, 18 months time, then I, from personal experience, reaching out to people and, and like you say, asking for advice, you can start to piece together the elements that you need. If I was yeah. starting from scratch now and you've just explained the, the business case, the financial aspect, and then, and then getting your pitch ready, if I was unaware of all of that, but I knew that the, the end point was, okay, I need some funding, then reaching out to people who've gone through the process and just saying, look, uh, just give me a heads up. Like, let me know that I am on the right path, point me in the right direction. And, and I think that is, as you've already said, is a really nice way to build a relationship because then people like to give advice for one, but also if they um, see the value in what you do and, and they're helping you along the process, you're, you're almost pre-preparing them anyway because they're giving you the guidelines within which to operate. And as yeah. long as you're executing within those guidelines, then yeah. it kind of makes sense for them to, to follow up. Yeah. We had you know, the, same, already. the same thing, similar thing with a client who was building a, he, he ran a consultancy that helped locum doctors. So kind of freelance doctors manage their accounting and, and operations so they could focus on doctoring basically yeah. didn't have to do all the admin. Yeah. Uh, he then wanted to turn that into a platform. Okay. Because it would be more cost effective to have a platform than hire a huge team and make it more scalable as a business. And we created all these materials for him. And then he went and did a practice pitch on his customers mm -hmm. to just say, this is what we're building. This is what's coming in the future. Just wanted to let, and I wanted to just kind of go through the pitch. And, and, and by the end of that pitch, he's talking to locum doctors. They're earning a decent amount, right? These, <laughs> these doctors. So, so he's by the end of that, practice pitch that he where he was really just sort of trying to get his customers excited about what the future might hold for his business mm. he ended up with 25 percent of his round pre-committed <laughs> by his customers mm. but then he was going to investors saying we've already got 25 percent of the round committed by our own customers they really want this mm. they want this so much they're going to invest in it themselves and obviously that meant it was much easier for them to open the door with investors, give the investors that confidence that this had traction. This is something the market wanted, something the market needed, because they're not just pretend saying I might sign up for this when it's ready. They're, they're investing in the thing. They want it so badly. It, if you if you go down that kind of route, you can open up so many, so many doors. Definitely. So look, on, on the flip side of the coin, you mentioned if you need the funding now, getting a, a list together and then starting emailing people where do I start with that? Do I go on LinkedIn? Is there, do I go on angel list? I guess that's LinkedIn's a good, good place to start. I love personally love Crunchbase. Okay. Um, Crunchbase is a great tool. You, you need a subscription for it. Otherwise you only get kind of five results from your search, but okay. you can, you can basically do a investor search on there and you can specify a location, a sector, all of these things. So you could say look, I'm looking for a, global an investor anywhere in the world who's got a track record of investing in new case based businesses in this sector mm. who are businesses raising this amount of money at a stage of development that is pre-launch post-launch later stage growth and then it will chuck out a list of 100 200 300 individuals okay. i can say i'm looking for angel investors individuals i'm looking for venture capital funds 
and it will filter their database down and it will give you their LinkedIn profile of every single one. So then you've got 300 potential LinkedIn profiles Mm. of investors that have a proven track record of investing in your niche, in your locality from anywhere in the world. You could then just say, I want UK based investors or whatever, but you can can filter this down and and you could then filter that list down and down and down. I, I like to think of it as a ripple. So, so you keep that those criteria quite tight and narrow to begin with and get a small list of maybe 20 or 30 people. And these are like your most likely to invest. And then you can expand those search terms out and create sort of those outward ripples where you get broader and broader and broader. But you can start really niche and have meaningful conversations with those most likely to invest yeah. and hopefully secure one or two of them as a as a potential investor and then you can go to the sort of slightly broader search list and kind of go look i've already got so and so and so and so committed yeah. and and that's more likely to give them confidence to want to invest and, and you can just just start connecting with them on linkedin and they say you have to just be we have someone as per make it as personal as you possibly can make it hyper personal like i know you've recently invested in because every single investor on on crunch base you can then look at their portfolio companies so you can okay. say hey, you've invested in company x y and z we're doing something exciting in a similar space or you could research one of their portfolio companies and look for news stories on them and go oh you must be so thrilled mm-hmm. that your portfolio company x just won this major award just something that says you're not just copy and pasting an email. You're, yeah, you're yeah. thought about why you're contacting that individual. That will give you the cut through that you need to kind of just stand out out of all the messages they get. And then you should just aim for aim for a meeting as soon as and just say, look, I'd love to chat. Is it is it worth meeting when the time is right? And just try and try and get in that that room with them as soon as you as soon as you can. Try and share as little information to get into that <laughs> as possible. Because the more you share, the more reasons they have to say no in my sure. experience. Yeah. You want to get them in the meeting so then they can address their concerns with you in that meeting and you can respond to them. Okay. Because if you just send everything, throw the kitchen sink at it and go, here's a link to all of our documentation. They'll there's it's got the reasons in there for them to say no without talking to you. So Okay. So I've 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 gone on Crunchbase. I've got my list. Um, I started doing some outreach. Obviously, research for personalization in terms of messages. Do the follow up. Try to get on a call if necessary. Book book that meeting. Do I? Obviously, I I, I go prepared in terms of I, I know the the outcome that I would like. So, are there some uh, some standard questions I need to be prepared for? And and secondly. Is this the stage, or even before getting to this stage, do I need to ha- have something ready for me to, to kind of give hand over at the meeting and say, look, this is what it's all about? Or is it, or is it just uh, a verbal exchange just to kind of qualify, I guess, mm. uh, or, or more of a discovery process before yeah. then going on to the next step? What, what do you think? About I mean, it will vary depending on the type of investor and, and the investor's own approach. But sure. the, the important thing is when you get to that point of let's meet or let's have a chat, because it's more likely to be a Zoom call or a phone call to begin with these days. Make sure you get work on an upfront contract of what's going to happen in that meeting. Agree prior to the meeting what what form that takes. So you can take okay. the lead on that and go, look. Typically, when I run the when I do these sorts of calls, what I prefer to do is a five ten minute presentation with a, sharing a few slides, and then the rest of the time is just sort of having a chat and a Q and A. And the investor might respond and go, "To be honest, I I hate sitting through those bloody presentations. <laughs> like, I'd much rather you just send send me a deck beforehand. I'll look through it. We'll jump on the call and we'll just have a chat. And you can go, all right, fine, that, let's do that. But at least what to expect from that call you might get invited in to pitch an angel group or a venture capital fund and, and you want to be asking the people organizing that going so what does this look like is there going to be a number of people in the room what do you want me to do is there an opportunity for me to present is it just a conversation understand what they want from you so yeah. you can prepare yourself for it because a lot of the time you might be meeting an angel investor for a first time in a coffee shop you're just meeting in a coffee shop in london somewhere and it'd be a bit weird if you got your unfolded your laptop, <laughs> got your clicker out and start yeah. in the middle of a Hold on, let me just put it on yeah. the white screen. <laughs> it's more likely to be a conversation and that pitch you've created ends up a conversation and you're skipping from 
so you would normally approach it in this order and you're yeah. skipping from slide to slide back and forth in conversation and you've got to just know your stuff and, and be able to, to to respond so you've got to have that flexibility but where where you you can try and kind of dictate this is how i'd like to run the meeting and they can then say that's fine with me or no i'd rather do it this way then after that meeting you want to follow up typically with a with the the pitch deck even if you've shared it in the presentation you want to follow up with a with a with that in an email probably your financial model as well i'd probably also include the business plan and just say look this is this is the the business with all the information you need but most importantly at the end of that meeting you want a call to action and the thing that we use is something called an expression of interest form okay. so it's a really simple form who you are how much might if you were to to invest in this round how much of this round might you commit so yeah. let's say it's a 500k round they might say oh, i'll do a check size of between 50 to 100k are you looking for can you bring anything else to the table other than money can you self-certify a high, that you're a high net worth individual or a sophisticated investor just just some simple questions it doesn't need to be too taxing it's not really about the information on the form it's more about the way you use it and this is about overcoming objections if we think about this going back to kind of this is basically a sales process we're trying to sell your shares to to an investor the meeting is going to go really well they're going to it's going to feel like they're interested they're going to say, ask you lots of questions you're going to respond they're going to f- be nodding along and you're going to think ah oh, i've got one here they're, they're, <laughs> like, they're super interested rather than just sort of walking away and go oh that went well you you can pull out this in- expression of interest form and just say look would you seems like you're you're interested in taking things further would you be up for filling out this expression of interest form? It just helps me better manage the round and know who's interested in taking things forward with us uh, and, and further discovery and who isn't. Now, the chances are the investor, no matter how positive the meeting went, is going to say, oh, no, I'm not ready to, to formally express my interest in this in this round. And you can go, yeah. no, no worries at all. To be honest, I didn't expect you to. It was a bit of a long shot, but um, I thought it was worth a go. What would you need to know from me? Mm. to feel comfortable filling in this expression of interest form. Oh, well, I'd need to know this, 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 and this first. Fantastic. Okay. Well, let's book a meeting in a week's time. I've got all of that information to hand. I'll bundle it together in a, in a folder, send it your way, and then perhaps we can, let's book a meeting for a week's time and we can talk through it. Get that booked in, go to that meeting, discuss the information they've asked for. You ready to fill out the expression of interest form now? Mm oh well mm, that's all well and good all good but but now I, I do need to know this this and this no worries let's book another meeting i'll get it all t- and you just keep going through that process until okay. they either rule themselves out or commit fill in that expression of interest form now if this happens maybe they still haven't kind of got there after two or three meetings you can be yeah. a bit more like what look let's be honest where are we at because i keep giving you this information yeah. keep having good discussions you're not ready to pull the trigger yet let's just be honest with each other are you are you interested are you not interested am i wasting my time it's okay to lead the round they're not some demigod they're just another human and you yeah. just need to, yeah. need to be honest True. with them and honest with how how you think it's going and go look are we is there is anything happening what's holding you back why are you not sort of committing because we've shared a lot of information now and i feel like you should you should have everything you need what what's missing and and just be honest with them because and control the round as much as possible so that yeah. that's what what you need to be doing because investors will go at their own pace so you need to kind of pick up the pace make sure there are there's always another call booked in and and you don't let them go cold yeah it it sounds very much and i know you you've mentioned this once already the like a sales and marketing approach so very much like generating your leads, having your marketing material, generating your leads, getting to the first conversation, dealing with objection handling, and then moving moving the investor to, to a close, right? To that expression of interest. That's it. And then obviously, whatever happens after that. that then there's you know, the legal process, which is akin to signing the contracts that you would do yeah. in a sales process. And, yeah. then, and then there's the delivering the product, which would be giving them their shares. Yeah. And giving them the money and even that point like the assumption is all right they've signed the legals and then they deposit the cash in the bank <laughs> yeah. we've had founders kind of not check the liquidity of the of the investors they're dealing with and they get all the way through that process to the end right. and then they're like legal documents are signed investors committed 
there's a legal agreement that they're going to invest X in return for Y shares. When are you going to transfer the cash? Yeah. Oh, well, about that. I'm trying to, I've been trying to sell a property in Spain for the last six months. As soon as that goes through, I'll be able to deposit the funds. Well, have you had any offers? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a slow market at the moment. Um, and they've had to wait 12 months to get really? before the cash was in the bank. All the legal documents were signed. They'd, they'd stopped reaching out to other investors. They had no other warm conversations because this oh, wow. guy had said they'd invest and they'd signed, signed all the documents. And it was an absolute nightmare for them. So you've got to do your due diligence on that. those investors at the same time as they're doing due diligence on you. Check yeah. there. Ask for intros to their portfolio companies so that you can check with the founders because those founders might say just steer clear absolute nightmare constantly on the phone every week wanting an update we spend more time updating him than we do getting on with building the business you just don't know what they're going to be like so you want to you want to do your own due diligence just to just to make sure you're getting in you're you're getting in partnership with someone who who's going to be a good egg going to be a good asset to the company right Look, James, I'm, I'm conscious of time. I know we've got uh, a hard stop, but I just want to, I guess, um, start landing the plane by we've covered a lot of ground in terms of preparation, what you need to be mindful of, I guess, to get yourself investment ready. I know, obviously, in the intro, we mentioned that you've written a, a best-selling book. Um, I would imagine having gone through the book, a, a lot of this stuff is is covered in more detail to kind of give people a roadmap as to what they need to to get ready and and prepare what are i guess two or three of the key contributions or the the key areas that they need to focus on i know we've got the 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 business case the financials Mm -hmm. i understand that aspect of it but in terms of getting the the pitch ready like where where does the focus need to be? And as an extension of that, how how do you guys at, at Robot Mascot help help people if if they are in a position where they they want to go out and start pitching? How do you help them get get set to go? Um, so I talk about a few different things in in the in the book on on that point. But we talk about when it comes to the pitch itself, we talk about structure, content, clarity, and design. They're the four components you've got to get the right structure that tells the right story in the right way and and we go through a five-step framework to to making that happen that i call the five acts of the of the perfect pitch Mm -hmm. you've got to get the copy clear concise articulate no waffle tell stories not just load it with facts and data people need to need to kind of engage in the vision and the mission and the value proposition before they understand the, the the facts and figures you got to make sure that that's clear that it's going to go back and make sure that content is clear and articulate uh, and then you need to make it look great you need to look like the billion dollar business you're promising you're mm. going to be, you know the multi-million pound business you, you don't want to look like a startup you want to look polished and professional so you have that's the first thing you see it's yeah. going to have, if it looks a bit in there the first thing investors are going to think is like oh this this <laughs> but i suppose i better better just check it out and they'll do a quick flick through and they'll go whatever you're starting from a negative kind of mindset whereas if it yeah. looks impressive and it's like whoa this company looks awesome their starting point is a is a much more positive frame of mind and that psychologically they're going to absorb all that information you're sharing in a completely different way based on that first impression yeah so you need to get that design right so that's kind of the focus in terms of how robot mascot help it's exactly what we've talked about today we we build the business plan the financial model the the pitch materials we write and design those for founders we do valuation reports so they they know what valuation they should be pitching to investors and then we run a whole kind of investor outreach campaign and, and kind of run a, a sort of a direct marketing campaign to to investors to get and, and high net worth individuals to get them engaged in in your your offer in your in your proposal so it's kind of start to finish kind of all the preparation all the way through to the investor outreach kind of getting to the point where those doors are opened those mm. investors are kind of going i want to talk about this in more detail and then you book the meetings and and close the deal we can give support guidance we have resources to help you with that bit mm. we do everything up to the point of of getting those investors kind of in engaged in your offer and i saw that you you've got a short quiz to kind of help people assess how investment ready there yeah so so pitchready.co.uk uh, is where you need to go and, and there's a, a short quiz it's it takes less than five minutes yes no questions 
that will produce a, a 12 page tailored report telling you how well you're performing across some of the key things we talked about today give you tips and advice on how to improve those areas so you can get yourself more investor ready and you'll also get a, an opportunity to order a free copy of my book yeah. Yeah. completely on us postage paid everything so completely free to your door so feel free to go to pitchready.co.uk and access that little sort of bundle of goodies if you if you are thinking of raising raising investment perfect well look james really appreciate you coming on to the podcast where where can people find you where where's the best place to connect LinkedIn is probably where I hang out most. So, so um, connect with me on LinkedIn or follow me on there. And I, I post regularly on, on that, but I pay, post regularly on most of the social media platforms. So you should find okay. me somewhere. LinkedIn is the best place to, to find me. Nice one. Well, look, James, thank you very much again. It's been really insightful for me. I've, I've learned quite a few lessons. So thank you very much for coming on to the show and hopefully we can, we can speak again. No, thanks for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure and, and great questions. Really, really enjoyable. So thank you. Well, thanks James thanks to you guys for listening to the Growth Lab podcast you can access the show notes and free resources via the link in the episode description and if you got some value from this podcast please pay it forward and share it with others across social media or leave a rating and review on whatever podcast platform you listen to as it would really mean the world to me hope you enjoy and subscribe and I'll see you in the next episode